very much, Dirk. Um, I had been asked to uh, present three slides on finance and growth, on the nexus finance and growth in low-income countries. So three, three slides go with three main ideas. One, one set of research questions uh, involves the nexus of finance and growth. The second one, the specific policy priorities. Can research identify specific policy priorities for low-income countries? in the transition to middle-income countries? What, is the, what are the lessons that we can draw from earlier experiences? And the third one is, uh, can research also assist in implementing strategies uh, to apply these policies? And my presentation will, around, uh, will uh, go around these three themes. So the first one, I think it's too cramped that you can uh, see anything. Uh, but let me just uh, perhaps um, repeat uh, that uh, empirical evidence has been only established since the early 90s about the causal link between finance and growth in the course of development. We had earlier work 40 years ago by Goldsmith, McKinnon, uh, and, and, and Shaw, uh, but uh, real empirical evidence was uh, uh, established by King and Levin in 93, Rajan and Singales 98, Beck and co-authors in 2000, and they all found that a well-developed financial system predicts independently growth. This is very difficult to establish because there are so many problems of multicollinearity because you have a lot of trends to observe that run over the same time, and you have endogenous endogeneity problems as well. But now, over the last two, three years, there is a trickle of research which makes this very fascinating subject, which has been connected to research uh, hosted by the IMF and by the Bank for International Settlements uh, that finds exactly a reverse link, which finds that beyond a certain threshold of financial intermediation and financial sector development, the financial sector independently predicts negative growth. And this is quite fascinating uh, finding, which uh, I wonder what is the evidence if you focus this question on, on low-income countries? Because maybe it's just a result that derives from the very developed UK, US, and other countries with a heavy presence of the financial sector, which have seen a lot of problems in the run-up of the financial crisis. Um, to understand this nexus, we have to reduce the complexity. And researchers reduce complexity by picking models, simple models, that succinctly link the nexus between growth and financial sector variables. And uh, in my view, the uh, Locus Classicus still remains Marco Pagano's paper in 93, European Economic Review on finance and growth, where he links the growth rate to the uh, way the financial sector impacts on the social marginal productivity of capital. It can do so by impacting on the accumulation, on the level, but also on the composition through allocation of capital. Uh, then uh, fee is a sort of transaction variable which describes how much of the savings is lost in the process of financial intermediation and doesn't arrive at investment because the financial sector is very inefficient to deliver some major uh, services such as uh, dealing with information asymmetries by monitoring credit uh, lenders, uh, by screening lenders, uh, or it may be also inefficient in transforming risk, it may be inefficient in transforming maturities, then they land in the balance sheets of, of firms and so on, and the whole thing can explode in your face. Uh, Ricardo Hausmann uh, talks about original sin in, in, in this uh, respect, and the question is, does the financial sector improve the situation, or does it make it worse? Um, 
So then you have also the degree of capital accumulation. What are the linkages between the level of investment and which is a very important driver of growth and the financial sector? And finally, the rate of depreciation. If the financial sector is crisis prone, you will have situations where you have to write down bank assets which we have seen in the past, which goes into the billions. The uh, average cost in OECD countries of bank consolidation is about 2 to 4 percent of GDP for extended periods every year. Mexico, for example, had 16 percent of GDP consolidated bank consolidation costs, and that, of course, also enters the growth equation. A very specific issue, set of issues relating to low-income countries and that reassessment I'm talking about is also to have a look at the transition that Mr. Lee was talking about from low-income countries to middle-income countries. Most of these cases you will find in Asia uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, two decades, and uh, you will see that they have not been characterized by a very fancy, uh, sophisticated financial sector. Very often, uh, the major source of uh, finance for firms was retained earnings, just like Germany, by the way, after the Second World War. Uh, so the, the question here is really what, uh, what can we say about corporate savings, which is something very neglected in economic theory. We have a lot of uh, theories about household savings, but we have very little theory on, on corporate savings, and I think this is also uh, a sideshow which might be of, in of interest for that specific transition from low to middle income countries. Uh, it could well be that the reestablishment of the nexus that I talked about uh, earlier doesn't hold for uh, poor countries because poor countries do not have reached these threshold levels that BIS and IMF research has recently identified, which is about uh, roughly when domestic credit is, uh, is larger than GDP <coughs> or when uh, financial sector formal employment is larger than 3.5% of total formal employment, you get these independent negative growth effects. So maybe we identify low-income countries where this is not the case, so we can be fairly uh, quiet on this front. Uh, finally, very important is also how did uh, the causes and then the gestation period of uh, systemic crisis develop uh, in low-income countries as opposed to high-income countries? Because the, you have many cases where there was not much contagion in low-income countries, and it would be interesting also to look uh, at that situation. Let me move to the second slide. Okay. Now, the second is about policy priorities. Uh, policy priorities for low-income countries, I think you can really distinguish two issues here. One is structure and growth, and one is credit cycles and growth. Uh, the structure is very much influenced by influential work by Justin Lin and others who have resurrected or have, have transformed, let's say, literally the Chinese experience of moving from a low-income country to a middle-income country. And uh, here the question is, within, within the context of these new structural economics, uh, what is the specific role for the financial sector? Philippe Aguillon, Harvard University, and others have also worked on this uh, issue. What is the role of financial intermediaries vis-a-vis -vis or in relation to direct securities markets in that transition would be uh, one uh, issue. Another issue of great importance is uh, funneling finance to small and medium uh, scale enterprises uh, and also to social investments such as garbage uh, removal. Can you make that bankable? Is, are there ways in low-income countries to make garbage removal, just one example, bankable? That is, these are, I think, the issues that uh, go around structure and growth. When we talk about credit cycles and growth, uh, we have to pay attention to the specific characteristics of low-income countries. These are countries that are shock-prone to volatility in raw material prices and in food prices in particular. Raw material, industrial metals, energy, and food prices. 
in terms of monetary analysis, I would think that the prevalence of shocks is very much in the real sector compared to financial shocks. So the origin, the causes of shocks are different. Therefore, we also would probably need different policy priorities for these countries in dealing with, with volatility. Uh, Counter-cyclical financial regulation, Dirk mentioned that already, uh, and lending is of particular importance in, in low-income countries. And uh, here the typical set of issues, macroprudential regulation, capital account regulation, uh, regulatory bank capital, how do you treat that to avoid that you have high explosive lorries running through your villages, I mean banks that are uh, overgeared. Um, is there also uh, for leaks an optimal sequencing? We have discussed this 20 years ago, sequencing of financial liberalization. Can we take, carry any of that discussion into the context of low income funds? Mm -hmm. Finally, the uh, question of policy implementation that is often neglected by researchers because you make your hand a bit dirty with that sort of work. But I think uh, from my experience, uh, also at the OECD, it's a very uh, important set of questions that uh, 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 in, in, uh, is, is involved uh, by looking at how do you implement strategies. So I talked already about the sequencing issue. Second, uh, what about the synchronization with a cluster of other policies? When you talk about finance, you, have, uh, you cannot do it in isolation. You have to look at the development of domestic bond markets. For example, when you want to estab establish a corporate bond market or a domestic bond market, you need probably a short-term segment of the public uh, uh, treasury markets. That, again, requires uh, conf uh, confidence in the short-term segment of the banking sector. So all these things are very much interrelated. Very often, pension reform has gone along with the development of these financial instruments because there were long-term in institutional investors who, who demanded these instruments that were not available. And in Asia, they haven't been available, so they have been created by the public authorities, for example, the sterilization bonds in Asia to cope with massive capital inflows. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done almost. The lack of sufficient infrastructure uh, uh, as well as the importance of remittances and the importance of informal labor markets are, I think, very, very uh, important uh, issues to consider. So uh, lack of infrastructure, the importance of remittances and informal la labor markets. How can the financial sector interact and deal with these features typical to low-income countries? And a final issue is the lobbying efforts in low-income countries. Low-income countries are often small countries. The elite knows each other uh, very well. You don't have a setting where you have anonymity, where you have uh, uh, meritocracy, but uh, where relationships are very important. And I think this has also to go into the equation. Thanks for your very good. patience. Thank you. Very good. Um,